You're about to watch a St. James Sermon. Thanks for joining us. We're currently preaching our way through the Book of Romans. Martin Luther once said that the letter to the Romans is truly the most important piece of the New Testament. And the more one reads it, the more precious it becomes. Well, we hope that's your experience too as we journey through this wonderful book together. Thanks for watching. What a lovely morning this morning. But wasn't it quite chilly last night? That's why I've got my sleeping bag with me. I'm getting ready for next Saturday. Why, you ask? I'm going to sleep outside. How does that sound? Who wants to join me? <laughs> Kathy's going to join me. Come on, guys. So, have we got an overhead? There's a, there it is, night on the streets. Who's heard of U-Turn? Anyone heard of U-Turn? Absolutely. U-Turn are putting on a night on the streets. It's to help us to um, gain some empathy and some compassion for those who don't get to choose whether or not they sleep outside. The plan is you can do it on your own. You can go to their website. You can do it at home with your kids. Uh, or you could come to St. James. And we'll host you here uh, just outside the DG Mills Hall. We've got a fence, so you'll be safe. But we'll sleep outside. We'll bry. There'll be a fire. We'll tell stories. We'll play games. We'll do whatever it takes to have a great evening. But we're going to sleep outside. The point of this is to raise a bit of money for the U-turn so that they can help people Stop sleeping on the streets. Get employment. Get off drugs and alcohol. And um, re-enter life as a, as a person who supports society. If you'll join me in that, there's a number of ways you can do it. You can come and sleep outside with me. There are a few people who've already signed up, so uh, good for you guys. Bring your kids, okay? Don't, you don't have to just be the dads. Trust me, bring the kids. Moms, you're welcome. <laughs> come along. Um, that's one way. The other way is um, just to make a donation. That could be in cash, or it could be tinned food, warm blankets, clothing, uh, anything of that nature. If you'd like to help us, I'm going to be at the table outside. Come and talk to me. Tell me how you think you can help if you're willing and able, and I will make sure that that happens. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing these um, people come and sleep. Um, I will do it uh, from the comfort of my bed. Um, it's just not for me, but I think it's worthwhile supporting. Okay, Mervyn, I'll do it if you do it. All right. Uh, that's the deal. Uh, <laughs> um, friends, there's lots happening uh, in the life of St. James in the week ahead. There's something for absolutely everyone in the week that lies ahead. Um, on Wednesday, our super seniors are watching a movie after their Bible study. So if you want to know more about that, uh, speak to Angela uh, Bush or uh, to Glinda Herman, if you want to find out what it is they're watching. Uh, then on Thursday night, our women are meeting together here at church for the Women's Connect event. Uh, there's still time to book for that, so please get in touch with uh, Jean or Allison or the church office or Haley, and you can find out more about that on Thursday evening. On Friday morning, the men are meeting together with Mervyn for men's breakfast at Hopper 6 here in the morning. And then on Saturday, as uh, Gerald just said, it's the night out here uh, or in your backyard, wherever you want to do it, in the cords of you. Uh, turn and the money they're trying to raise. Uh, and then on Sunday, if you want to come join us, it's Baptism Sunday, next Sunday, and we'll be baptizing uh, seven kids by my count so far. So uh, that'll be next Sunday, and uh, we look forward to having you slot in and get plugged in where is most appropriate to you. Lots happening. Please make sure that you stay connected with us here at St. James. It's now the time in our service where we can give to the gospel work that we do here at St. James. The stewards will take up the collection. Uh, please also use this time to chat to those around you, greet them, say hi, and wish them a happy Mother's Day. Good morning, St. James. My name is Bongiswa Grosh. We'll be doing our reading from Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 25. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, 
his faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also, um, also speaks to the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from his works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believed without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of circumcised of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he will be heir to, uh, he will be heir of the of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and guarantee to all of his offsprings, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is father to of us all. Sorry, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God, in whom He believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, He believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered upon our, trans our trespasses and raised for our justification. This is the word of God. It's good to see you. Welcome to St. James um, on this Mother's Day. <clears throat> You'll be glad to know that Stephen and I are doing the cooking and that Alison and Joan and Kirsten will be going for takeout afterwards, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it works out. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word, <clears throat> for its truth. Pray that as I look at it now, as we look at it, that it may come to us with fresh force and, yep, as we think through the implications, that you'll give us open ears and willing hearts to hear. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Romans chapter 4, Paul makes um, a striking claim about biblical Christianity. The Christianity that he's been explaining throughout this letter. In his own day, especially to the Jewish hearers who heard him, the claim that he makes would have been very controversial. It may or may not be controversial for us, we'll see. <clears throat> it's an important claim, however, for us to understand, one that will help us in our reading of the whole Bible, and one that I think, if we understand it correctly and respond to it in the right way, will also help us in particular with our witness to our Jewish and Muslim friends 
or neighbors or colleagues. Three questions then as we look at Romans 4 together. Two that we want to deal with as quickly as possible, and then a third one that we want to spend a little bit more time over. So question number one, what is Paul's claim? Now Paul's claim isn't summarized in any particular way in this chapter. You really have to work it out from everything that Paul says. But let me summarize it like this. Paul's claim is that his teaching about righteousness before God, where the word that he uses is justification, Paul's claim is that his teaching about justification being by grace alone through faith in Christ alone, that that teaching is not a Christian invention, that it's not some kind of theological novelty, but rather that it is in fact the true fulfillment of all of God's purposes and promises in the Old Testament. That the teaching of justification by faith in the New Testament is entirely in line with the teaching of the Old Testament. To put it more briefly, Paul's claim is that all of God's Old Testament purposes and promises find their fulfillment in the New Testament gospel about Jesus. Now that may not sound very controversial for you, but it has significant implications, as we will see. That's his claim, that the Bible has always taught justification by grace through faith. Not a different message in the old and the new, but one message across the whole Bible. You got it? That's his claim. How does Paul make and establish his claim? Well, of course, he does it, as you would expect, from the Old Testament. In particular, he quotes Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6 when he talks about Abraham. He quotes Psalm 32 when he talks about David. And using the testimony of the Old Testament, he focuses on these two great Old Testament heroes. Abraham, the father of Israel, the father of the nation, that is, and the recipient of all of God's unchanging promises, beginning all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. And David who was undoubtedly Israel's greatest king and the pattern for Israel's messianic hope. Abraham and David are the examples that he chooses from the Old Testament to establish his claim. Let's start with David because Paul just touches on David in a few verses and really focuses on Abraham. So where we are is Romans chapter 4 verse 6 to verse 8. What do we learn from David? Listen to what Paul says. David speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. There it is again, right? Righteousness apart from works. And what does David actually say? Well, this is Psalm, verse, Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. <clears throat> Blessed is the person against whom the Lord will not count their sin. Psalm 32 is the psalm that David wrote after the whole sin with Bathsheba. You remember the story in the Old Testament? David David falls for another man's wife, Bathsheba. He goes into her. He has an illicit relationship with her. She falls pregnant. When the news comes to David, he orchestrates for her husband, Uriah to be put in the front line of the battle and he is eventually killed. Lust, adultery, murder. Well, a hand in the killing of Uriah. Now in Psalm 32, and you may just want to turn back there very quickly, in Psalm 32, David tells us about his own experience after that sin. Psalm 32, in verse 3, he tells us what happened when he kept his sin hidden. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, he says. Through my groaning all day long, day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Unconfessed sin, hidden sin, is a great burden, right? It's chews away at our conscience, it lies on our heart and mind, and it oppresses us. We keep it hidden. David has covered up his sin. 
And the experience of covering up his sin was for him. Sin was a terrible thing for him. But then verse 5, he tells us, I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. So he brought his sin into the light and to the Lord. And what did he discover? Verse 5, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So David had a cover-up going. Then he was open and honest with God. He spoke to God about the things that he had done wrong. And what he discovered was not that God drove him away, pushed him away, but rather that God actually forgave him. And so David concludes at the beginning of the Psalm, verse, Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, the bit that Paul actually quotes in Romans, David concludes that the truly blessed person, the person who is, as it were, approved by God, because that's what the word blessing means, the person whom God approves, the person who is right with God, is the person whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, against whom the Lord does not count their sin. What a wonderful lesson to learn. Old Testament, the lesson is, God puts people in the right with himself by means of forgiveness. Well, that's the gospel, right? That's the gospel that Paul has been preaching. So Paul's gospel about forgiveness in Christ is entirely consistent with what David himself experienced all those years before. Not helped through religion, but helped by coming to God and being open and honest with God about his sin and discovering that God is a forgiving God. That God is a God who does not hold our sin against us if we bring it to him. Justified in the sight of God through forgiveness. What then do we learn from Abraham? Second lesson. Well, Paul dwells on Abraham because really in many ways, as I said, he is the father of Israel and the recipient of all God's great promises. So Paul puts his focus there and he reminds us that Abraham, just like David, discovered, or rather before David actually, that Abraham discovered that righteousness with God comes through faith, not through works. That's chapter 4, verse 1 to 4 of Romans. What shall we say? Did Abraham, our father, gain? Well, if Abraham was justified by works, he'd have had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the Scripture say? And now he quotes from Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, while the men of the house are doing the cooking and the catering and the setting of the tables, why don't you, ladies, go and read Genesis chapter 15, the first part, for yourself. And blokes, after you've done all the washing up, there's the opportunity for you to go and read Genesis chapter 15. Perhaps on Saturday night, as you're out here in the car park, you can reread it again. What will you discover? What you will discover is that God, who had made great promises to Abraham in Genesis 12, do you remember how the story unfolds in the Old Testament? The Tower of Babel, human beings in rebellion against God, a terrible scenario, no hope for the world, really, it would seem. What does God do? He calls one man, Abraham, he makes promises to him. Promises of a land, of descendants, of a great name, and of a blessing. It's all in Genesis chapter 12. You can read it for yourself. By the time Genesis 15 comes along, time has gone by. As we read at the end of Romans chapter 4, Abraham is an old man and his wife Sarah is unable to have children and God had promised him a descendant, a son, and nothing has happened. Years have gone by. Abraham's got older. Both of them are past the age of childbearing now. And in Genesis 15... Abraham gets a bit cranky with God. God says to him, do not fear, Abraham. I am your shield and your great reward. Abraham says, well, what can you give me? I love that bit about Abraham because it reminds us that when we've got an issue with God, the place to go is where? To God. You've got a problem with God, go and tell him to his face. It's no good moaning about God to other people. What's the good of that? 
gossiping about God, slandering God, bagging him out, saying, yeah, well, God should have done this for me and he hasn't done it. Please don't come and tell me that I can't help it. Don't do that to your friends. The thing to do is to do what Abraham and indeed David himself did. When we have a struggle with God, the thing to do is to go to God himself and tell him how we feel, right? That's what Abraham does. How can, well, yeah, 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 you say you my shield, my great reward. But actually, you haven't given me an heir. You haven't kept your promise. God, in his kindness, says to Abraham, go outside. Abraham stands outside. God says, look up at the sky. What do you see? It's nighttime. He sees the stars. God says to him, so shall your offspring be. In other words, a promise has been made. It seems as if God is not keeping his promise. God's response is to just make the promise again and to give Abraham something to look at to reinforce his faith. And what do we read? Genesis 15, verse 6. And Abraham believed God, and God declared him righteous, reckoned him righteous. The way to be right with God is to believe what he says. Now, Paul goes on to say something else here, and it's worth us just noticing this. Chapter 4, verse 10. Next week, we're going to have a baptism service, and more is going to be said about how New Testament baptism completes and fulfills the Old Testament sign of circumcision. So I'm not going to do that today. But I want you to notice chapter 4, verse 10. When was Abraham declared right before God? Was it after or before he was circumcised, says Paul? Answer, before. In other words, he wasn't justified in the sight of God by some religious act of circumcision. In fact, circumcision was given, says Paul, as a sign and the seal of the righteousness that he already had by faith. So he wasn't justified by religion. Look with me at chapter 4, verse 13. Was Abraham declared in the right with God by keeping the law? No. Why? Well, as Paul tells us also in Galatians, the law was only given some 400 years after Abraham. So there's no way that Abraham was put in the right with God by keeping the law because the law hadn't been given yet. So what's Paul's point? When you look at David, you discover that being right with God comes through God's forgiveness when we speak to him about our sins. When you look at Abraham, you discover that being right with God is exactly by putting your faith in God. Righteousness comes not through works, but through faith. It's the gospel that Paul has been preaching all through Romans. There's a second thing that we learn from Abraham, by the way, and you will notice that in verse 21. Just look at chapter 4, verse 21. I noticed that this week, actually, as I was preparing, trying to work out how much of this Roman stuff do I take, Romans 4, do I take and unpack for us here. Now, please go and read through Romans 4 again. I think you'll find it, I hope you'll find, it lines up with what I have been saying. I haven't gone point for point for point through the whole chapter, right? We'd be here all day and you'd miss your Mother's Day lunch. 4.21. Well, you wouldn't actually because you'd leave. And I'd be uh, preaching to myself, which is also not good because I've got to cook. So 421, what do we discover? Just look at chapter 4, verse 21. And see if you can work out a definition of what true faith is. Just take a moment. Maybe talk to your neighbor in case you're napping. You can wake your neighbor up. Have a look at chapter 4, verse 21. See if you can work out from chapter 4, verse 21, what true faith is. It's a wonderful definition of faith. You got it? Faith is being fully convinced, persuaded, that God is able to do what He has promised. What a great definition of faith. Faith is being persuaded, fully persuaded, convinced that God is able to do what God has promised. No good believing what God has not promised. There's a lot of false Christianity around, right? Where all sorts of promises are put in front of people that God has not made. And then when those promises don't come to pass, what are the people told? 
You don't have enough faith. Rubbish. Of course they've got enough faith. It's just that their faith isn't in nonsense. All sorts of promises made. You know, if you're a Christian, you'll be healthy, wealthy, wise, and I don't know, I can't think of a fourth thing. Maybe your rugby team will win every time. But of course, the problem is, if people make promises that God has not made, we ought not to believe them. This is promises that pastors are making. But when God makes promises, which we know from Scripture... Those we should believe. Right? If he said it, if he said it, I'll believe it. If my pastor says it, I'll check it in the Bible (laughs) to make sure that it's right. And if it's in the Bible, then I'll believe it. And if not, nah. So, Abraham is put in the right with God through faith, through believing what God has promised. David is put in the right with God through forgiveness, through experiencing God's amazing forgiving grace. Paul's point, the claim that he makes and that he establishes, is that the way to be right with God through faith in Christ is exactly in line with the Old Testament. And that the New Testament is simply the fulfillment of all of God's Old Testament purposes and promises. Now, that may be new to you, that may not be new to you. It's not particularly controversial, is it? I don't think so. But we all need a little bit of controversy in our lives, don't we? So here are the implications. The first one is super not controversial. The first one is simply this. If the whole Bible teaches that the way to be right with God is through faith in God, believing His promises... Abraham believed the promises that God gave him, but of course now those promises have been expressed for us in a new and in a fresh way in the person, in the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's the promise that we are going to remember again when we come to the table, that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be faith in him, we can be put right with God. So if the whole Bible is teaching that, I think it's fair to say that we should act upon that, right? You think? Well, that's pretty obvious, and we've been saying that week in and week out. And honestly, dear friends, if you haven't yet acted upon that, if you haven't yet put your faith and trust in Christ, please, will you do that? Don't put it off. Don't put it off. And of course, if you have put your faith in trust, then the lesson we learn is that we keep trusting Him all the end for our justification. Yep, nothing controversial there, but still important. Secondly, Paul's claim reminds us, therefore, what he's done in chapter 4, what he models in chapter 4, reminds us that the whole Bible is Christian Scripture. So if you're just a New Testament person, then I need to say you need to grow your Bible reading agenda. Okay? Because if the whole Bible is Christian Scripture, if Abraham and David and all in between are pointing us towards the gospel and expressing in their own terms the gospel preached in advance, the gospel promised beforehand, then as Christians we must be whole Bible people, not just New Testament people. Agreed? So if your Old Testament Bible reading has fallen off the cart and you think, ah, that's Old Testament now. No, no. And by the way, if we think that the God of the Old Testament saves us by works, but the God of the New Testament saves us by grace and faith, then we're reading the Bible wrongly, correct? If we're setting the Old Testament against the New, then we've got a big problem. So, whole Bible reading, not just New Testament Christians. But of course, that also means that when we read the Old Testament, we need to read it in a new way, correct? Because if the whole Old Testament points us forward to the death, resurrection of Christ and the gospel implications of that, then the way we read the Old Testament must be with gospel glasses on. We need to be reading the Old Testament with a view to the New Testament. And that takes a bit of work. And can I encourage you, um, if you haven't ever read it, to get Vaughan Roberts' little book, which is called God's Big Picture, I think. It's a tiny little book. You can get it at CBD. Vaughan Roberts wrote it. It's called God's Big Picture. It's a great help for how to read the whole Bible as Christian scripture. 
And it's probably time in our growth groups that we do a little bit more with that again at some point. We've done it in a Bible overview before. So when you read Proverbs in this week, <laughs> let's not just read Proverbs as law, but Proverbs as the outworking, outliving of the grace and the salvation that comes to us in Christ. In Him, in Jesus, is found what? All the wisdom and knowledge of God. If we want to be truly wise, what must we do? Put our faith in Christ. And having come to Christ for true wisdom, we can then work hard to live wise lives every day. Do you see what I've just done there with Proverbs? That's how we need to read the whole Bible. Not so controversial, but very important to say. Now, I need to gird up my loins and prepare for maybe some pushback. I don't know. There it is. Thirdly, third implication. If the Old Testament is pointing forward, signposts, shadows, pointing forward to Christ, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, remember talking about the ceremonies and the festivals and all of those things, he says these are the shadows and the types of what was to come, but the fullness is in Christ. If that is true, and it is true, then if we as Christians suddenly get told by our friends and our family and our neighbors that the way to be more spiritual is to become more Jewish, we need to point blank ignore them. In fact, we need to remind them of the gospel. Hmm. So I don't know if you have friends, family, neighbors, or if you are one of those friends, family, and neighbors who is telling your Christian friends that they need to go back to the Jewish festivals, do this, do that, feast of booths, feast of this, feast of that, more this, more that, God forbid circumcision, but because Paul says that in Galatians, look, if you're going to go that way, you may as well go the whole way, right? But if you find yourself being pressured or told that the way to become more spiritual as a Christian is to become more Jewish. Don't believe it for a minute. When you get to Cape Town, you really don't want to go back to Beaufort West. I mean, I've got nothing against Beaufort West. <laughs> right? But when you arrive at the destination, there's really no point in driving all the way back to Beaufort West and saying, Yay, Beaufort West! Yay! You have to go through Beaufort West to get to Cape Town if you come on the N1. Mavrochis, when you get here, don't go back there. Well, let's not do that spiritually, friend. When we've arrived at the fulfillment in the person and work of Christ, really, we are not more spiritual to become Jewish now as well, as if that adds anything. Galatians is a letter written to correct that error and warn against it. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Number four. I think it's number four. Not only are we not to become more Jewish in order to be more... By the way, let me just say this. If you happen to be Jewish, there's nothing wrong with doing that as long as you do it in the light of Christ. So I'm not saying that Jewish Christians shouldn't keep their Jewish culture. I'm just saying that those of us who are not Jews should not think that we have to become more Jewish to be more spiritual. Do you understand? And if as a Jewish person, if you are here as a Jewish person and with your friends and family, your Jewish friends and family, you go through the festivals with them, well, that's absolutely no problem. Paul's got no issue with that. He's just wanting you to use those to point to Jesus and not think that in and of themselves they are sufficient. They're just signposts. Number four. Not only are the promises of the Old Testament fulfilled in Christ, but they are actually expanded in Christ. They are made bigger and better. That's what Hebrews tells us. How does Paul show us that in Romans chapter 4? I wonder if you saw it in verse 13. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. This is my real point of getting into trouble, but that's fine. Maybe not. The promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the land did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Yes? No. That is not what Paul says. 
Abraham did receive a promise of a land. That little area of the Middle East that is now in conflict. Right? That was the promise to Abraham. But notice what Paul does with that promise. Look again at verse 13. I read it wrongly, didn't I? Or wrong. The promise to Abraham is offering that he would be heir of, say it with me, the world. Abraham was promised a land, but in the light of the gospel, the Abrahamic promise has been expanded and exploded beyond a piece of geography to the whole world, beyond a piece of this earth to the new creation, beyond the city of Jerusalem to the heavenly Jerusalem, which means that that part of the Middle East is no longer holy land. It is no longer holy land. It's just land. It was holy land in Abraham's day. It was holy land through the Exodus. It was holy land when the temple was built with David, but no more so. The place of blessing now, Ephesians 1, is where? Not there in that land, but in Christ Jesus in the heavenlies. The Jerusalem, which is our mother, is not the one on earth, but the one Galatians, which is above, which will come down out of heaven. Mm. Now, dear friends, we may have all sorts of views and opinions about the Middle East and about the rights of Israel as a nation. They have rights. The rights of the Palestinians, they have rights. We, have, we may have all sorts of views about the war in the Middle East. But let us be crystal clear about this. That being pro-Israel is not being more spiritual. I'm not saying we should be anti-Israel and no Christian should ever be anti-Semitic. Right? No Christian should ever be anti-Semitic. No Christian. We know what happened in Nazi Germany when the gospel was turned and twisted in that way. The Jewish people have a right to live on the face of the earth and they have a right not to be persecuted and not to be hammered by everybody. But so do the Palestinians. And we have Palestinian brothers and sisters there, Christians, some of whom I know personally. So we've got to think this through, right? Being a Christian doesn't mean you're anti-Palestine, pro-Israel. Now, Hamas is a different story. But we're not talking about that. And the behavior on both sides has been absolutely abhorrent. Agreed? Abhorrent. So no more Holy Land talk. You don't have to go and get baptized in the Jordan and think it's going to make you more spiritual. It won't. The place to be truly, truly Christian is in the fulfillment of all of those promises. And where is that? What is Paul's great phrase? In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in whom all the fullness of God dwells. 2 Corinthians, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. Now, you want to bat with me about that? Feel free. I'll be down here. But for my own conscience sake, dear friends, I haven't wanted to stand up here and talk about the Middle East and all of that stuff. Just somernet been a lot of talk about all of that, right? I have wanted to do that when the Bible takes us there. And today, the Bible has taken us there. So let's think clearly about the conflict in the Middle East. If you want to be supportive of the nation of Israel, feel free, you have the right to do that. If you want to be supportive of the Palestinian state, feel free, as a Christian, you have the right to do this. Like the elections in South Africa. As a Christian, you have the freedom and the right to vote for whomever you like. And you must live with the consequences of your decisions. But when it comes to Christianity and God and His promises and the spiritual things, for well, those are in Christ alone. Now, I've taken longer than I normally take in my preaching, but I hope that you have found that helpful. It's time now to come to the Lord's table. I'm going to lead us in a prayer as the stewards come forward.
As we do that, let's remember that the true, true children of Abraham are those who share Abraham's faith. What a wonderful way to witness to our Jewish and Muslim friends, right? To tell them that their longing to belong to Abraham can be fulfilled through faith in Jesus Christ, Abraham's great seed. Don't you think it's a great way to talk to them about the gospel? Faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Merciful Lord, we do not come to this your table trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your great mercy. We are not fit to gather the crumbs under the table. Your mercy is everlasting. Lord, grant therefore that we may so eat and drink by faith in Jesus, that we may be united to him and he to us. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. After supper, Jesus took a cup, and he gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. You'll be served where you're seated, we'll eat together, and then we'll drink together. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving. Let's eat together. Be served and we'll drink together. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve you body and soul to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Friends, how good it is for us to be together on this day to hear the Lord's word taught and again, to be reminded of this great God we have, a God who is faithful to the promises that he has made. Friends, if you have not yet been persuaded that it is good and right to put our faith and trust in God, please come talk to myself, come talk to Mervyn, leave a little record of your visit. We'd love to get in touch with you and talk to you more about the Christian faith and introduce you to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for us, so please would you join me. And now may the peace of God, which is above all understanding... Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. And to this God's people said, Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you in the week.